In a few minutes, we'll be reading some out of Genesis 1. I'll kind of be summarizing a few verses and then reading other verses for emphasis, but that will be our text this morning. Um, I wanted to start by just asking, and this is as a rhetorical question, what is informing and then forming you? What is regularly informing and therefore forming you? And then what is the fruit of it? So what's informing your life regularly? And then what's forming you? How is that forming you? What's the fruit of it? So we need to keep taking a look at that because there's always things that are forming us. And sometimes what is forming us when we look at the fruit We actually say, man, if I'm honest, it's really uh, making me angry, or it's really making me fearful, or it's really making me feel hostile to a, a particular group of people, or it's really making me arrogant as if I'm the one, I'm in the know and nobody else is. Or maybe what's forming you is forming something in you that is bringing peace, uh, what, what the Bible in Hebrew would call shalom, kind of this, this peace that brings wholeness and completeness in your life. And maybe it's bringing humility and, it's, and maybe it's bringing peace between you and God and you and others, right? So what is informing you? How is that forming you? What is the fruit that's coming out of that? As Jesus followers, we need to regularly consider this our ideology, our mindset, our worldview, because it is this that we go out and we interact with the world with. So for, for many, what's informing and forming them is kind of a mishmash. And really, in some sense, that's true for all of us, right? We think about our upbringing, our, our traditions that we grew up with or we still hold on to today. Maybe your, your particular slant with politics, your personal experience, your temperament, your personal inclination, your personal opinions. And then that's often, especially today, it's really been true for a long, long time, that's combined with media voices that we tune into that speak a steady stream of confirmation bias into our minds and our hearts. But if you're really a Jesus follower... If, if, if Jesus is really Savior and Lord, the risen King of your life, then there should be a constant pursuit to be informed and formed by him. And, and to the point that you even allow this at times to blow up some of the narratives and, and some of the ideologies that have and are forming you. Or that you find false security in when they do not align to the will and the way of Jesus. And, and the problem is, is that we, what we so often do is the opposite. We try and twist and pretzel Jesus into our ideologies. Rather than the other way around. Rather than us conforming to his. So as a human... Jesus was informed and formed. That might sound strange to you, but remember verses like Luke chapter 2, verse 52, that says that as a human, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. He was formed and formed, uh, informed and formed um, within this cultural narrative that focused on Yahweh and his people. And he knew the scriptures, and he knew, he knew the story, and he knew the law, and he knew the prophets. And, then, and this was also informed and forming him through the counsel of the Holy Spirit. And, and humanly speaking, this is how Jesus understood and interacted with the world. Combined with his divine nature as the Son of God. And from this divine nature and consequent human formation, he lived and he taught. And one of the many themes that Jesus touched on regularly, and I would, I would argue that he touched on it regularly in a way that often is in conflict with our ideology, our worldview, 
is how his followers are to see and understand and use human resources, earthly resources, creation's resources. Again, this ideology was not formed by our 21st century modern lenses, right? It was not formed by our politics. It was not formed by systems like communism or capitalism. Instead, it was formed by a genuine understanding of his father God. And the narrative, the scriptural narrative of Yahweh God and his people counseled by the Holy Spirit. So as Jesus followers, we are called to pursue Jesus's understanding and values concerning the world's resources. And specifically, I'd like us to ponder over these next few weeks how this informs and forms us personally and corporately to live biblically generous lives. As a local church, this little satellite community of God's larger church throughout the past 2,000 years, as a church at Mountaintop Grace Community, one of our core values is that we would be a people of generosity and service. Months ago, I was contemplating uh, this theme, and I listened to a podcast series uh, by the Bible Project, and not coincidentally, I don't think. They're, they're actually touching on generosity. If you're following their, their, their podcast now, they're touching on generosity as they walk through the Sermon of, of, on the Mount series. Um, but years ago, they did a short series on generosity. And I just loved how they framed Jesus' understanding of God's creation. And, and they presented God as as an abundantly generous host, a host. He's an owner that has welcomed, created, but welcomed us as guests to enjoy and then amazingly even co-govern and develop the potential of his creation. Tim Mackey says, Jesus views creation as a stable place where we're being hosted by a very generous God. So, oh, do I think of God that way? Do, do, I, do I view his creation that way? Do I view God as this generous host? And, and if I do or if I don't like that, that really will affect how I live my life. So let's take the next few minutes before we share together in the sacrament of communion to ponder this theme, God, the exceedingly generous host. We'll begin in the beginning, and I want you to have an ear specifically tuned into to be listening for the nature of God and the nature of his creation that he places his image bearers in to inhabit, to co-govern, and to develop the potential of. So in Genesis 1-1, we hear of God creating the heavens and the earth. Like I said, I'll sum up a few, and then I'll read a few verses. Or as the Nicene Creed states it, All things visible and invisible. Uh, The author David Atkinson suggests that this statement refers to the totality of the created order describing everything that is not God. Now, to be fair, Bible scholars will debate until Jesus' return the exact meaning of verses like Genesis 1.1. But at the very least, we see God create the heavens, that, that, that which we can see, and likely also pointing to that which is unseen, this, this higher unseen realm of which the throne of God dwells. And he creates this space called earth that becomes this this place where humans, his image bearers, will dwell. And then it goes on to explain what that looked like. But he creates all of this out of what 
at least the New International Version calls, out of which was formless and empty, or um, as Tim Mackey likes to translate, wild and waste and dark. But God's Spirit is also there. It says that God's Spirit is, is hovering over the waters, and God's Spirit is, in one sense, you could say, ready to give birth to this creation. And into this dark chaos, God speaks light. He speaks beauty. He speaks ordered complexity, and he speaks ordered rhythms. Light breaks into darkness, and both light and dark find their ordered rhythms in day and night. Then God brings the chaotic waters to order, creating an expanse between the moisture above and the moisture below. Maybe, maybe we can think of our atmosphere in that. And then he, he orders the waters below and he separates them so that there is both land, dry land, and seas. We'll pick up on verse 11. Read verses 11 through 13. Again, keep your ear tuned to what is the nature of God in this? What is the nature of his creation? Verse 11, then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seeds in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the third day. And then after this, God creates the sun creates the moon, he creates the stars, he brings these to order, and again, these are used to bring orderly rhythms. It says seasons and days and years. Some see the stars here as literal stars, others interpret, interpret it as the creation of other spiritual beings. That's an interesting conversation for another day. Picking up at verse 20, and God said, let the water team with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with, their, with which the water teams according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. Verse 24, and God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish and the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the earth, whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, 
I give every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were complete in all their vast array. By the seventh day, but by the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested or ceased from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. And then just verse 15, chapter 2. The Lord God, or Yahweh Elohim, took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So as you listen to that account, and, and I hope, again, the sad part is sometimes you have read something so often or heard it so often or heard the idea so often, you can kind of tune out and stop hearing it afresh. Hopefully you can hear it with some new ears. As, as you listen to this account with the perspective that, that God is creator and owner being a host of which we as his created guests now inhabit and are given authority to co-govern, to to develop the potential of, what are, I'm asking you, so what are some of your observations about the nature of this creation and the nature of God as creator host? What What are some observations? The nature of creation and the nature of God as creator host. So, so the environment that we see God place his human, human image bearers in, in Genesis 1 and 2, I know we didn't read it all, but it's one that not only sustains life, an absolute miracle in and of itself, right? But it's one that's beautiful, that's full of artistry, and is super abundantly filled with resources, I mean, that's the idea you get. It's super abundantly filled with resources, and it has this profuse capacity for the development of more and more and more and more. And, and, and as the all-powerful creator, Yahweh God, is the owner of it all, he hosts us as creator guests, and then he delegates, like, like Morgan said, he delegates with this, to us with this staggeringly gracious and free creative co-rule over his creation. Care for it, govern it, grow it, expand it, be creative, do as I do. This is a vastly different picture, a vastly different picture than when you'd find in the imagination of ancient pagans. Most ancient pagans, the, the majestic creator God that Israel worshiped, didn't create humans as like slaves to do his bidding. Oh, well, you know, I'll make these little, you know, these little ants that can kind of work this thing that I created and like so I don't have to work too hard. He didn't create us that way. Instead, he's exceedingly relationally and profoundly generous. Loving to delegate and empower this is the picture he get, we get. He sets up his image bearers, not as slave labor, but as free co-rulers who can, just like him with artistry and imagination and creativity, further his vision of creation. Go out, go out to all the earth, multiply, subdue, be creative, be imaginative. To, you know, do as I do, my image bearers. And, and he sets them up for profound success. Even the raw materials that that he gives them naturally procreate and multiply. He's setting them up for success. He sets us up for success in this. The humankind. All their needs are supplied in plentiful abundance with the creation brimming, brimming with further potential. It's really a cool image. (laughs) In one sense, you step back and you say, what, what kind of God is this? <laughs> and here's what I want to tell you this morning. And I think it's something that can get so easily missed. God has never stopped being that God. God's never stopped being that God. 
He is as he, I love that uh, this, I had to chuckle this morning and almost have a tear when you say, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? Hebrews chapter 13, eight speaks of Christ. It says that he is the same yesterday and today and forever. Yahweh God is still the God who is exceedingly relational and the God of super abundant generosity. That's who he is in his very nature. And he is the same yesterday and today and forever. He's still the creator host of beauty and order and ordered rhythms and life-sustaining complexity. We're still his created image bearers that are guests empowered with freedom to co-rule, to thoughtfully and artistically and respectfully and worshipfully develop the vast potential of his creation in a manner that loves and honors him, in a manner that loves and honors his creation, including all human beings. But we all know that something has gone painfully wrong, don't we? And and when this idea of God being exceedingly relational and exceedingly generous, one that supplies in an overabundance, this picture of God that we get in Genesis 1 and 2, when that meets the realities of this world, realities like poverty and corruption and inequality and injustice and sickness and pain and death, when it meets those kind of realities, we tend to see an apparent contradiction. We say, how can you believe that this is true of God? How can you believe that this is true of his creation when there's so many people that lack even the basic necessities of life? But here's what we need to remember in that apparent contradiction. Yahweh God is the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen? He did not change. We changed. We changed. We rebelled and lost our way. We introduced decreation into God's life giving created order. The tension that we now feel does not speak of a different God, it speaks of a different human. And we'll get more into that next week. But I would be remiss not to say here that into this rebelliously altered humanity, the, the creator Yahweh God continues to be his relational and super abundantly generous self. So much so that he is willing to himself come to earth to be conceived of the Holy Spirit, the same spirit that was hovering over the waters that brought birth to creation, born of a human woman, his, born of an image bearer, born of this dirt creature image bearer, the son of God, the son of man, Jesus Christ, Jesus Messiah. He's like, I'm still this exceedingly relational and super abundantly generous God. And he shows by coming. He shows it by giving himself to redeem us. Remember those who are here, part of the Ruth series that we just did, to redeem, to buy back through the giving of his own innocent life as a ransom for our guilty lives. To restore, listen, on an even higher level, God's original plan that we could be reconciled and restored to God but now with a status of being his very children, that we would be, by the Spirit of God, reborn as children of God as we put our faith and trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord. And as we're reconciled to God through his Son Jesus, when we, re- when we come to him in repentance and faith, and find forgiveness and reconciliation. As, as, as we're reconciled, we return to the same God as Genesis 1. 
He has not changed. The exceedingly relational, profoundly generous God who looks to grant us freedom to creatively co-rule and develop his vision of creation, which will one day give birth to his eternal kingdom, a renewed creation, a perfect and eternally renewed creation upon Jesus' return. Now, we still live in a tension, right? We live in this tension of living in the brokenness in between God's original creative design, the fact that we changed and we rebelled, and, that, and what we know and trust and hope in, in this renewed and restored creation upon Jesus' return. We live in this tension in between, But here's what's fascinating. I love this, right? Since we've returned to the same God, the same God that we see in Genesis 1, through Christ, Paul says things like this. Let me give you just a few examples. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. That though he, right, speaking of Christ, was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor so that you might through his poverty become rich. And again, he's not talking about driving a Lexus there, right? He's talking about, so he says, he, so he, uh, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Not a couple, not one or two, not a few, every spiritual blessing in Christ. He says it at the end of Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. In one sense, we could be like, Paul, what world are you living in? (laughs) He's believing in the right narrative is what he's doing. He knows what God he's returned to through Jesus Christ. He knows the nature of that God, the nature, the original design of his creation, the nature of the creation to come. Now, these these truths that I just read, right, are are the way they're presently realized, at times we might say, ah, it, it kind of feels unfulfilled. And that's true because like our Savior before us, we still experience oppression and injustice and pain and suffering in a world that continues until the Lord's return to be corrupted by humanity's choices. But God's word is also telling us that as Jesus followers await, as we wait for all things to be renewed in Christ, we are presently the living signposts of that future renewal here and now. You are, if you trust in Christ. You are a representation of the future renewal. As we follow and trust in the same God of Genesis 1, now redeemed and restored on an even higher level as the children of God reborn by the Spirit. As we trust in the sacrificial death of Christ, as we trust in a God that raised Jesus from the dead, as we trust in, the, in Jesus and he ra- spiritually raises us from the dead, as we know that we have a, a future inheritance and a bodily resurrection guaranteed for us in Christ, as we are sealed with, Christ, with Christ's Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. As we await the eternal kingdom, we actually live in that kingdom now. We live into the realities and values now, even as we wait for its full consummation in whatever temporary and broken kingdom we find ourselves, whatever kingdom that would be. 
whether that be North Korea or Russia or Afghanistan or Israel or the United States of America, whatever broken kingdom that may be, we live into the realities and values of the kingdom to come because we are the representatives of that kingdom alive here and now. So let's bring it full circle as we look to land the plane, as some would say. Returning our, our, to our main focus, the creator Yahweh God of Genesis 1 is a relational God who's, who's generously created a world of superabundance for us to inhabit and co-govern and develop the potential of. If this is truly the nature of God, and at least the original design for our engagement of his creation, and if we're to live even now into the reality and values of a renewed creation to come, what should this view of God, this view of creation, form in us? And how should it affect how I'm outwardly interacting with my world even now. Any thoughts? I'll just lay that out there for, to you for a minute. Any thought? What should that be forming in us? If that's truly the nature of God, truly in nature of who we are in Christ, truly in nature of the values and realities we're supposed to be living into, what should that form in me? And then how should that be playing out as I interact with my world? Yeah, so let, let, me, let me land a plane. And again, I'm trying to get the juices flowing just a little bit this morning. Just give me another minute or two and then we'll share communion together. I, I think inwardly, just a couple thoughts. This view should reorder my perspectives. It should reorder my worldview, right? Of God, of creation. With God, it should bring me, and this echoes a lot of things you said, it should bring me this incredible confidence and trust and security in God's loving care. Does that mean I'll never suffer? No. Scripture's very, very honest about that. But at the same time, we, we, can, we can completely trust and throw ourselves on his loving care and have complete confidence and security, security in it. And then concerning creation, it should reorder how I perceive my responsibility toward it. I'm not called to abuse and exploit it. Some Christians are just like, well, it's all going to burn or, well, it's all going to be renewed. Uh, imagine if I, you like loaned me your house for a month and I just went in there and I trashed the place and disrespected it and just like turned everything upside down. And when you came home, I was like, hey, listen, I think it's all going to be renewed someday anyhow. It probably wouldn't be respectful to you, would it? probably wouldn't honor you no instead God still wants us to care and tap the potential of this of this earth in a way that respects him and worships him as owner and host the creator Yahweh God so outwardly I begin to act accordingly toward creation including all human beings all God's image bearers in a way that reflects the relational and generous God that I trust in that I know cares for me and his intent for his people toward creation. I'll live in freedom and creative artistry with, with inventive ingenuity. Continuing to promote God's vision of creation and the big things and the small things, the everyday mundane things with respect and worship. And I'll, I'll also trust in God's care in such a way that I'm freed to care for others, to treat other people with the gracious and generous love that I've received from God in Christ. And I'll do that in relationships and I'll do that with my resources. I'm gonna wrap up just with a, a couple of paragraphs by David Atkinson and then Maggie will come forward. <clears throat> he writes, everything we see, everything we handle, every creature we meet, Every person who crosses our path is a gift from the creator's hands to be treasured, honored, treated with respect. It is from this conviction that we need to begin in trying to develop a Christian mind, right? What is developing and forming you on many of our contemporary environmental and social questions? I will note this was written in like 1990. 
our concerns for pollution, our motivation to avert the ecological crisis, our anger at terrorism and hatred of war, our delight in beauty and our support for the arts, our, fight, our fighting against the depersonalizing trends that so much of the modern ideology that, that fills so much of modern ideology and for social and economic justice in the world, our longing to learn how to love our neighbors better, all these themes, which rightly fill the pages of much recent Christian writing, need to be traced back to their beginnings. And their beginnings are to be found in the God who makes all things and who makes all things new, our deep human concerns for making things better is itself a reflection of the character of God. And then he quotes Revelation 4.11, Worthy art thou, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou didst create all things, and by thy will they existed and were created. Our intended goal of this five-week series is to develop a biblical view of generosity. But to do so, we need to continue to pursue and develop a biblical view of our God. We need to listen to, be informed, and formed by the right story, if there is to be right fruit. Amen?